Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to everyone on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. And I do have a couple of announcements, but if you have an additional announcement, let me know that. Um, Amy, our lovely Amy, has invited all of you to sing along with everything we're singing today. So feel free to do that, even the special music. Um, so that'll be fun. There will be no choir rehearsal on Wednesday. Choir rehearsals are finished for the summer, but Amy is drawing together small groups and adding musicians for our summertime music. So if you'd like to sing, let her know. <laughs> and uh, so those are really forming right now. The uh, Bible study will not meet this coming Wednesday, but will meet on June 8th, I think, as deciding how to move forward. Um, and let me see if I've said everything I said I was going to do. I think I have. Does anyone else have an announcement for this morning? Okay. Let's sing Peace Like a River and stand if you're able. For this Memorial Day weekend church service, we remember all those who have died serving our country since the Civil War. We honor them. We have families in our church whose members are or have been part of the military, and we honor them as well. We visit cemeteries to remember and honor many others here and around the world. Today I have a brief personal story and a poem for you. My husband, Evan, grew up with a good friend, Richard Brenning, whose father was pastor of the First Congregational Church. After they graduated from high school, Richard's family moved to Lincoln, Nebraska. In the time of the Vietnam War, Richard joined the Navy as a pilot and Evan the Marines. In 1969, Richard died in Vietnam. Our younger daughter, Sarah, a junior, on a junior high school trip to D.C., knowing how much her dad cared about Richard, made a rubbing from the Vietnam Wall. And this is that rubbing, which we've saved for many years. The poem takes place at the Vietnam Wall. And it's by Yusuf Komenyaka, who is a graduate of Colorado State University, actually. And he is a very well-known black soldier and journalist in Vietnam. And it's called Facing It. 
So he's at that very reflective Vietnam, good morning, <laughs> very reflective Vietnam wall, and he's looking into it, facing it. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't, damn it, no tears. I'm stone, I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me like a bird of prey, the profile of night slanted against morning. I turn this way, the stone lets me go. I turn that way, I'm inside the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down the 58,022 names, half expecting to find my own in letters like smoke. I touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby traps white flash. Names shimmer on a women, woman's blouse, but when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Brush strokes flash, a red bird's wing cutting across my stare. The sky, a plane in the sky, a white vet's image floats closer to me. Then his pale eyes look through mine. I'm a window. He's lost his right arm inside the stone. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. My hope is that remembering Richard Brenning and remembering uh, Yusuf Komanyaka's visit to the Vietnam Memorial Wall that helps you remember someone today, someone personal to you. Our special music this morning is This Land is Your Land, and you can feel free to sing along.
you like me to announce the congregational opening hymn? Absolutely. <laughs> Please sing the congregational opening hymn, America the Beautiful, and stand if you're able. Good morning again, and happy Memorial Day. So in a moment, I want to invite you to share in prayer with me, and then we'll offer the blessing over our offering this morning. But in talking about it being the Memorial Day weekend, I do want to share a little bit of news with you. Some of you have asked about the shirt I'm wearing today. It is an, actually an official Hawaiian shirt made in Hawaii, but there is somewhat of a story behind it. We recognize that just about all of us have either served in the military or know someone who has served in the military services. So we honor you if you served or your loved ones who have or your friends. And likewise, on my dad's side of the family, there's a strong history of serving in the Navy and this shirt is actually a gift from my little brother, Nick, whom you've been able to learn more about over the past few months while he was feeling well enough as he's battling stomach cancer, as many of you are well aware, he had the chance to go down to the Naval Air History Museum in Pensacola, Florida, and he likes to make that trip as often as possible in the past. So this shirt is a gift from him. So not only do we think of Memorial Day and honor those who have served and the freedom that it has purchased for us, but also... It just has that sentimental factor. Plus, I love planes. And Top Gun has opened this weekend. Top Gun 2, the sequel. I see a few smiles there. Go ahead. Don't be ashamed or bashful or shy. Raise your hand if you've seen Top Gun, the very first one, the original. Okay, there's a few hands. I grew up on it. I was a little kid when that came out. That made me want to be an aviator. Obviously, that has not worked out. But I can wear the planes on my shirt, so... God is good in many ways. He directs our paths. And as we reflect on how he has helped to chart the course that we've embarked upon throughout our life, I invite you just to pause with me here in a moment for 
a moment of silent reflection of prayer. As you can see, there are many names on our bulletin and many names on our weekly updates, those whom we keep in our prayers and those who are also on our hearts and our minds at any given time, those whom we need to pray for healing, for comfort, for God's strength, for provision in this world. So keep those individuals in your thoughts and prayers. We continue to pray for those affected by the school shooting in Texas, and it affects all of us, but especially those who are impacted in that community by that, that tragedy. We pray again for those who need blessings of health, those battling illnesses and cancer. We all seem to know someone in that, that fight. And also a special request to keep Jim and Donna Webster in our prayers. They need our prayers as they, they are quarantined over there at Hillcrest. And we recognize with it being the holiday weekend, many people are traveling. Uh, we know there's that, that show going on in South Dakota, so many of our members are up there in the Black Hills. How beautiful. So we pray for summertime travel safety and for the praise of our children in this community, our church, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, the joy that that summertime brings. So now, if you will, let's just pause. Let the silence speak to you as it does to me because our world is so big. Let's just let the silence for a moment speak to us as we speak to our gracious and loving God. Our gracious God, in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. We are so grateful for this day. Help us to rejoice and to be glad in it, to make the most of each and every day, for it truly is the renewed gift of life, that renewal of your breath in us. Lord, we pray that you will continue to watch over us and guide us, our community, our church, our neighborhood this state, the nation, and the world. We know the needs are so great, but we know that you are at work, and we pray to be a part of that, for we're called to be a part of that work as believers and followers of you. We pray, Lord, for those who need your hand upon them as a great physician to bring the healing that only you can provide. We pray for those who need that strength and comfort and provision as they face various hardships. We need your guidance and wisdom each and every day, gracious God, that we can make the right decisions. We can discern what is your will at any given time as we seek to serve you and grow closer to you with each and every day, knowing how much you have loved us and guided us throughout our lives. When we look back, we see where your hand has been upon us the whole time. Help us to share that light with this world, your light with this world. Lord, we pray that you will continue to be with us during this time of worship of you, this time of praise and of word and of music. Let it be satisfying, glorifying to you, gracious God. Be with our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren as we look forward to summertime and knowing that you are with us in each season. Lord, we just give you all honor and praise. And together we pray in your holy name. Amen. We recognize that we can't outgive God. He doesn't expect us to do so. But we are called to be joyful givers to offer what we can. So I will invite your, your shared blessings upon our gifts, our offerings, our tithes, our donations of time and talent this morning.
Will you join with me in asking this blessing? Again, gracious God, we pray. We ask that you will bless these gifts, these offerings, these donations of time and talent. May they be used to strengthen this church and to further your kingdom, both here and throughout the world. For this we pray in your holy name. Amen. All right, thank you. Our children may be dismissed to go to Discovery Club. The choir, if you'd like to join the rest of the congregation, you can, or you can, you can rest there if you'd like. <laughs> so, you could go to Discovery Club as well. So I know there are always treats and games there. So <laughs> Once in a while we have treats and games. and There was one time I even taped candy to the inside of bulletins. Ask Christy. It tied into the sermon we were the sermon topic that we had that day. So you never know. Surprises can happen. <laughs> so. so this morning, in thinking of how we can tie things together as we're on this theme of freedom, the freedom that we have been blessed with, the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, as well as recognizing sacrifices that help to purchase that freedom, the sacrifice of Christ that gives us true freedom and those who have given so much of their time and of their lives so that we can be here today. What an honor. And so the idea here is stripes or bars. And to kind of break that down a little bit more, the idea that by His stripes, His wounds, we are healed. By His stripes, we are given this new life and given new strength and new hope. But then the idea of bars that sometimes these are often self-imposing restrictions and limitations, we don't always see that freedom 
We don't always see that freedom in the way our lives have gone or the roads we have traveled. But God has been there throughout. And He's helping to take us somewhere. And we're going to see an example of this in our Scripture here in just a bit of how Paul truly exemplifies this. But stripes or bars. And it kind of leads me to this suggestion here that we all want what is right and fair in life. Don't we? We all want what's right and fair in life. I mean, we live in a world where we can be consumers and we can make sure that we have what is right and what is fair. I mean, let's talk about the right order. Whether it's something you order on Amazon or you go to the store or it's dining out or it's even going to Mickey D's. We want the right order. How many of you have ever had to send something back for a refund? Something that you bought wasn't right. It didn't fit right or it was defective. Yeah, you send it back. How many of you have gone, especially to a more expensive, more luxury dining experience and the food just wasn't right and you had to send it back? Have you ever sent an order back? Yeah? God bless you because I'm always afraid to do so. Ask Christy. Uh, Especially while in seminary, I didn't eat out much because I didn't have the money. So after seminary, I probably made up for lost time. I think I need to go back to get a doctorate <laughs> to lose weight again. But I'm always afraid to send something back because like, oh, I don't know. But we want the right order. We want what's right. What about what's right on the not-so-open road? The not-so-open road. Talk about out in traffic. And something changes when people hop into their cars, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. It changes. It's not the so open road anymore. We've got the construction on I-25 and the congestion here within town. And somebody cuts you off. Sometimes the yield sign is interpretive or interpreted as you go faster so I can beat you. Or I go faster so I can beat you. Doesn't have any implication of yielding and stopping and waiting. The not so open road. Thank God that God isn't the DMV, right? We're not judged on that record. But we also we also want justice as well. That's right and fair. Justice for all. Things to be made right. Here's an example that popped up just a couple days ago. It's on my Facebook feed. It comes from Fox 17 in Nashville. It just caught my attention. I don't know what you guys think. But here's, here's the headline. Sheep sentenced to three years in prison for killing a woman. A sheep was arrested and sentenced to three years in prison after killing a woman in a rural village in South Africa. So the story behind this is that a ram that was loose attacked a woman to the point that she was killed. And so when we say we want things right... The ram, the sheep, was put on trial, so to speak, and is being sentenced to prison for three years. And then the owners of that ram will need to pay the family five cows. You know, this seems strange to us, but this is an idea of vengeance, of making sure things are restored and right. So why do I bring all this up? Well, because Paul, the Apostle Paul, the founder of so many churches, the apostle to the Gentiles, who traveled to speak the good news, said that, well, God is making relationships between us and Him right. He has. He's done that work. He's given us that right and restored relationship with God so that we can have that relationship with others. We talk about being vertical and horizontal with God and with us. Only possible through what God has done. And so when Paul is traveling on his first missionary journey, He gets the chance to speak. And there's a common theme. So, for example, this couple of verses here. Paul is traveling. He goes to visit a synagogue on Sabbath, like we go to church here on Sunday. And they listen. They listen to what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures from the prophets and the writings being read. And then they're invited to speak. They're known as men who know a little bit about what we would call the Bible, about Scripture, and they say, well, do you have any encouragement or a word for us? And Paul, imagine this, Paul shook his head and said, uh-huh, yeah, <clears throat> cleared his throat. And he spoke about the whole history of God's work 
in the world up to that point, what God had done for Israel, leading them out of bondage in Egypt to freedom, guiding them through the desert, bringing them into the promised land, working with them through the law, the law that would point to Jesus. So he leads them through the history. And here's the punch. Here's the climax of it. He says, therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Liberation. Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through Him, through Jesus, everyone who believes is set free. Freedom. From every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. No matter what you did, no matter what you tried, the law itself just helped to convict us of our own sinfulness. There's more to come, more to come in Jesus so that we can have that true freedom. The big idea, God desires what's right even when everything else seems to go wrong or we don't understand it, or our journey is filled with difficulties, there is a journey going on that God is helping to chart. Us being here today, God desires what's right even when everything else seems to go wrong. Does that resonate with anyone? Boy, it resonates with me in different seasons. You can be trying so hard. Everything is going well. Then that illness comes up, or that cancer diagnosis, diagnosis of cancer that you didn't expect. The hardship, the lost relationship, you name it. But God wants to make all things right. He desires that, and He has, again, going back, restored us to a right and loving relationship with Him. And so... When we encounter those detours, keep this idea in mind. A route detoured can be a healthy start or a healthy restart. We have this freedom and God is about restoring relationships and He has restored us to Him through Jesus Christ. A route detoured is not a loss, but it can be a healthy start or restart. Your trivia today... What is this a picture of? <laughs> Gas prices, that's one of them. It's Love's Travel Center. If you've gone on a road trip at any time, you've probably passed by a Love's or a Pilot Travel Center. We pass by one every time. Well, we pass by many going to Tennessee. But I share this because have you been on a trip before or even a regular commute somewhere and you had to take a detour? Can a detour lead to new discoveries? Sometimes. Sometimes good and sometimes bad. I share this picture because Chrissy and I have a very special Love's Travel Center in Boonville, Missouri. If you ever go down I-70, going east, stop at the Love's Travel Center in Boonville, Missouri. Here's why. It is the trickiest one to get into. You want to talk about a detour, you get off the interstate, and then what should be the entrance to the travel center is actually a road. It's actually a road that takes you to not being on the road because we were trying to get in there. I said, surely, Christy, turn here because this is where we need to go to get into the gas station. And we go down a little bit and realize, uh-oh, we're stuck. We're going off the road because when Christy went to turn around, thank God for rental cars, when Christy went to turn around, we went off the road. The front wheels were off pavement. Now, she's a skilled driver. She was able to kind of turn the wheel until it got traction again on a front-wheel drive car. And then we made it to the, the Love's Travel Center. But a detour can help you to make memories or discover something new. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed by the gas prices. 99 cents, $1.29. I think this picture was taken when I was three, but... Actually, it's from 2020 in Milwaukee, from the Milwaukee News Journal. So, I don't know. But a detour. A detour. The Apostle Paul had them. We're going to talk about one in a moment here. A detour. So, as he prepares for his second missionary journey, and he has these plans of churches he will revisit and those new areas he wants to discover and to proclaim the good news, the gospel... 
He's prevented from doing so. Prevented not just from a physical detour, but from the Holy Spirit speaking to him. Here's what happens. During the night, Paul, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over and help us. Wow. I wish I could get visions like that to know what to do and where to go. And God can do those. Again, God can grant those visions. But here, for a particular purpose, He keeps Him from going a certain direction to go another, to come and help someone. How many around us are saying, come and help us? We've been in that spot before. Come and help me. So I want you to start here with thinking of this idea that God helps to chart a course of places and people for us to proclaim the good news. Places and people that go hand in hand where He directs us. Even if we're here in Loveland, in this neighborhood, it's a place. and There are people around us who may not be in a vision saying, come help us, but an opportunity to proclaim the good news. And by proclaiming, I mean there's this element of the Word, of what we share and speak, and then deed, what we share and do. You see, as we get into our larger passage of Scripture today where we talk about freedom, Paul had that detour. So he heads towards Macedonia, and he ends up in Philippi. And so it's the Sabbath. It's like us looking for a church or going somewhere where we can pray and hear music on Sunday, he goes down to the riverbank where he expects Jewish individuals to be there praying and speaking about God. And instead, down there, he meets Lydia. You've probably heard of Lydia before here in church world and through some of our other sermons and discussions. Lydia is the merchant of purple cloth. And being a merchant of purple cloth, then she's probably somewhat wealthy, and she's at the riverbank, and he shares the good news with her, and she's convinced, and her whole household is baptized. But then also, so we have the very wealthy, influ- influential Lydia. Then shortly after, again, going down to the riverbank, there's this slave girl, Luke tells us here in the book of Acts, this slave girl who helps her owners make a profit by telling the future. And so she follows Paul and his command- companions, and she's saying, These men are from the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear what they say. Listen to what they say. And she follows them, but singing in an annoying way and just trying to cause a commotion that Paul turns around and casts out, as the Scripture tells us, a demon saying, this is not of God. And just invoking the name of Jesus isn't going to have power over other people. So they're speaking out to a slave girl who doesn't know any better, who's being misused. And because of that, to help set the stage, the owners say, you've just ended our business. You've just taken away our profit. So they drag Paul and his companions, Paul and Silas, before the authorities and say, look what they're doing. They're telling us to go against Roman law because Roman law says you cannot worship any gods that are not approved by the state. So here's where we jump in. And see where freedom and provision and restored relations happen. Listen to these next few verses. It comes from Acts chapter 6, if you want to follow along in your Bible or on your Bible app. But here's the next part of that story. The crowd, not just a few people, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped per the Roman protocol to be embarrassed and ridiculed, to be stripped and beaten with rods. Not just the condemnation, condemnation or a criticism or a dislike on Facebook, but to be beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. So when he received those orders, he put them in the inner cell, the deeper dungeon, 
and fastened their feet in the stocks so that they could not move at all. About midnight, given all that has happened, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Can you picture that? That's hard to picture, but wow! Wow, God! And the jailer, of course, hearing this commotion, he woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he knew this wasn't going to look good on his resume. He drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself. I don't know why he didn't rush in there with a torch or a light, but he knew something had happened. He saw that the doors were open, so he's ready to do what is the honorable thing in a moment of dishonor, like, I'm responsible for this. I will take my life. Because he thought all of the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Anything you've seen on TV that features a jailbreak, you know they don't just stick around, do they? If there's doors open, they don't stick around. But here, Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Knowing that this powerful experience, this incident, was from God. Sir, what must I do to be saved? And sometimes we struggle with that idea of to do, to be saved, because that implies an unsaved condition and we recognize there's nothing we can do except to believe and they replied believe in the lord jesus and you will be saved you and your household then they spoke the word of the lord to him and to all the others in his house and at that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house. That would be uncommon to bring prisoners, so to speak, into your house as a jailer and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. Wow. Every time I read that, and I've read it a few times, and I've read it in seminary, that still makes me say, wow. What God can do to change lives, our lives, the lives of others. You see, no matter how securely bound we are or others are, God through Jesus can set people free. No matter how securely bound, God through Jesus can set people free. That's good news. That's good news. Why? Because it means there's always hope. Always hope. And it also means for us, those of us who have been in church world for a while, that there's always work to do. There's always work to do to help people know this message, to experience the freedom of Jesus that makes those chains fall away. You know, if we went back a few verses... Isn't it interesting that the magistrates told the jailer to guard them carefully? If they were just prisoners, why guard them carefully? This is emphatic. It's a, it's a very odd instruction because they haven't stirred up a riot to the sense that they were fighting, drawing swords, doing something violent in, the, in that aspect. They were speaking. Guard them carefully. That means there's something supernatural at work and people are kind of scared or if anything, they're on their toes. They're on their toes to the point that they want Paul and his companions put into wooden stocks. No movement at all. And even though they're the ones locked up, it's the jailer. The jailer, who was probably like a middle class person, had some money, had some influence, 
He's the most imprisoned because he doesn't know Jesus. Think about that. So, so far, Paul has had the ability to talk to Lydia, who represents the top of the social class, the slave girl who was set free from the fortune-telling demons, spirit, being imprisoned to have to do the work of, their, of her slave owners. And now the jailer. And I think there's an idea here. I think it's the idea that we see the world through lenses. Don't we? We see the world through lenses, through the lens of our experience and other lenses that have shaped our perspective. Those aren't always helpful. I mean, I've been wearing glasses since I was in the third grade. If you guys are getting too sleepy or frowning or or something, I can take my glasses off and everyone's smiling because it's just all blur. It's a colorful blur. Amen. But I need these lenses to see more clearly. Other lenses can shade our perspective. The lenses of how do we see those who are homeless? For whatever reason. Those who are destitute. In depression. Going through lost relationships. Lost jobs. Economic hardships. Struggles. How do we see them? In a variety of categories, wealth, education, economic status, social status, weight, size, so many lenses through which we see people. How does God want us to see them? Through the lens of relationships made right, starting with Jesus, putting us into the right and restored relationship with God. These are things I think about. I know being a pastor. But looking around in the community saying, help me to see more clearly, Lord, what I need to see. Because even in the worst circumstances, there's always a freedom that we have. Even if everything is taken away, we have the freedom of song and prayer. That's worship to me, song and prayer. It happens even amidst amidst pain and suffering. The worst of the worst. Song and prayer can happen even when there's pain and suffering. Paul and Silas locked up and it's midnight. And what do they do? They sing. They sing hymns. They pray. They're the light at midnight. Can we do this? I mean, when I read that passage a couple days ago, as I prepared it for today, I'm thinking, can I do that? Because there's no indication in what's recorded for us that they prayed, God, get us out of here. Set those bars loose. Let them fall down. Let us be released. There's no indication they prayed for release. And me, I would. I'd be there against the bars saying, let me out especially being a Roman citizen and you shouldn't have been thrown into jail without a trial. That's not fair when we talk about what's right and fair. Let me out. They didn't pray for that. They sang and they prayed and probably praises to God so that others could hear them and know there's freedom even when you can't even get up and move. God desires what's right even when everything, everything seems to be going wrong. Where does that get us today? Well, we talked about detours in life and how they can lead to new discoveries that God helps to influence or is working within. What about a route that's shaken helps to reawaken? I know for those who are my editing friends and former editors. That's probably not the best grammar, but it rhymes. A route that's shaken helps to reawaken. I think it does. And I think that's where most of us are. And if we aren't there, maybe we need to be. And here's what I mean. COVID. Yeah, we can't get away from that word. We can't get away from its continued ramifications. COVID. Is still about. And it has shaken our world, hasn't it? In ways we never could have anticipated. 
economic ways, social ways, health and medical ways, even the way we perceive others, all of these things have been affected by that. We look at other news in the world, violence and inflation and so many other things that do help to reawaken our senses to maybe what God wants us to see or to do. And I don't think it's anything new. Go back to that passage. An earthquake. Really? Do you find that hard to believe? Today, here in 2022, an earthquake that could shake and rattle those prison doors open, that's supernatural, super power from God? Seems kind of hard to believe. An earthquake? Really? But that's what's recorded for us. That's what Luke writes, and that's what Paul and Silas lived through. An earthquake to shake everyone awake. You can never lock up the presence of Jesus. He'll rattle the foundations. And that's good because sometimes we need those foundations rattled. And it's not the first time it happened. For whatever reason. I don't expect an earthquake to happen now. Thank God. I've only been through once in my life. I was a little kid and it was a little rumble here in Colorado and I jumped out of bed. Not sure what it was. Those who have lived in California, I have some friends in San Francisco. They know what earthquakes are. They have to build and prepare for earthquakes. So. But you can never lock up the presence of Jesus because even if you try to do so, He will rattle the foundations. Here's another example of this that happens earlier in Acts. Go to chapter 4. You see where Peter and John, they had a short stint in jail too. They were locked up for what they were speaking around the temple. So they're locked up. And then they're brought before the Sanhedrin. And they're questioned and they're interrogated. And then even a wise, influential person, Jewish leader, Gamaliel, says, well, if these men are speaking truth, then only good can come. They are from God. If they're not, this will fizzle out. It will fade. There's no truth to it. But if there's truth, then we're messing with fire. Let them go. So they are released after this long interrogation at the Sanhedrin, and they go and they tell others what God did for them. And they talk and they pray, and it tells us that after they, Peter and John, prayed, the place where they were meeting, meeting was shaken. The place where they were meeting with the people with whom they were meeting, it was shaken. And that very word means to swell like the sea, like the waves rise and fall and crash. The place was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Mm. Wow. Wow. You see, it's not so much about the places, per se, but the presence. The presence of Jesus there. The Holy Spirit coming upon people. Recognizing God is there. Recognizing that there is a power to help us, to bless us, to guide us, to be together with one another and to look forward. The best way I can maybe help illustrate this is, well, it's summertime. What's one of the favorite summertime pastimes? Baseball, right? I love baseball. We talked about that a little bit last week. Tony Evans, a well-known pastor, he's a great preacher. He has great illustrations. He said he was speaking with someone who became a major league ball player. And he said growing up, they played baseball in the backyard all the time. Him and his friends out there. And they played so much that they were wearing out the grass to the point he remembers his mom talking to his dad and saying, Honey, can't we get them off the grass? They're killing it. There's nothing but dirt in places now. And the dad said, Sweetie, we're not raising grass. We're raising kids. Amen. We're raising kids, not grass not about the place as much as the presence 
and what's happening there. What was happening in that jail? What does this mean for us? What does it mean for me? The, me, the immediate effect of belief in Jesus, I believe, is a changing of heart. Not a change of heart, but a changing of heart because there's something that is started, a spark, but it has to be continuous. It has to be not just a change, but a changing throughout life. I remember joining the church as a young adult. I remember getting involved. I remember the excitement and the change that it initiated. But like life, things happen, you get busy, that excitement, that sense of excitement and amazement and wanting to go make a difference, that wanes. It needs to be a changing of heart throughout. What did the jailer do when he heard, well, he saw what had happened. He heard the word of the Lord. He took Paul and Silas and he washed and cared for their wounds. The wounds that they had received earlier from being beaten. He took the time to care for them. Wash the wounds. Help to treat and to heal those wounds. Then he invited them into his house for a meal. That's a change of heart. That's caring and sharing in only a Christian way. It can only happen by the change that Christ brings. Paul had other options. Remember, he was a Roman citizen. He could have arraigned this jailer on charges that you unfairly imprisoned me. I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to a higher authority that I deserve a trial and not to just be locked away. Why is this important? The way I see it, the way I experience it, maybe you do too, is it tells me that I need to make sure I'm still in a place to help care for wounds and to help share a meal. As a Christian, as someone who wants to share this with others, word and deed, it's not always easy. There are people who are harder to get along with. Those whom you don't want to speak to. Those whom you would cross to the other side of the street or hide away until they left the room, whatever it might be. It's not always easy. But this tells me I have to be in a place to be willing to care for someone's wounds physically, emotionally, spiritually, and to provide a meal. But provide nourishment, even if it's encouragement, or actual food. It's constant work. It's constant work. The thing Tony Evans said about not raising grass, it made me think of the, the years I spent in Tennessee. And I love mowing the grass, but I realized coming from Colorado, you don't just mow the grass every couple of weeks like you can here. No, you mow twice a week. We had five acres of land. Half of it was clear and full of grass. And I helped my dad mow it. And we were out there with push mowers to start with until we got wise. We came in like foolish Coloradans, like we can do push mowers and mow this grass. Well, then it rains and that grass grows taller. So you got to mow at least twice a week in some seasons because if you don't, it can become a jungle. You can lose small kids in there. It grows. It grows. It's constant work. We're at constant work too. You see, kindness is a superpower of its own. And there is no kind of Christianity to take and choose goes back to that idea of being the consumer. Here's what I want, here's what I want, and here's what I don't want. There is no kind of Christianity. But our faith, our faith expresses its realness through kindness. And it's a full investment. A full investment that has rich rewards. But it's going to take some work. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some detours. But God desires what's right, even when everything seems to go wrong. He's all about making it right. We all want what is right and fair. That's what we started with this morning, right? God desires that all should experience that right and restored relationship with Him. And we're a part of that journey. 
Think about it. A route that deterred Paul from his expectations and led to an innermost cell of a jail didn't bar the Gospel at all. Amazingly, instead, it set so many more free. What an idea of freedom through the proclamation of the Gospel and the work God is doing. Amen. May God bless this message which shares His Word and together as His people we say, Amen. So there's a slight correction on your bulletins this morning because you can't go without enough peace. Peace that God brings. We're going to sing as our closing song, Peace Like a River, as we did this morning. So as you're able, I invite you to please rise and let us sing together, Peace Like a River. So, as we did last Sunday, and you may be seated as you would like, for our benediction, I want to encourage us to continue to work together and praying together. This prayer might look familiar. It is the one from last Sunday. So if you haven't memorized, terrific! I've got that candy for you. Well, give me a minute. I'll run down to the gas station, that treat. But praying together. Let us pray together. Continually as a church family. And so, will you read it with me? It's in your bulletin and here on the screens. Dear Lord Jesus, we gather as a united people in Your name, a family of believers in Your amazing love, in Your enduring authority, and a family in Your gracious gift. Fan the living flame of love within us to dismiss the vision and strive and to believe anew that You are healing, inspiring, strengthening, and empowering Your people and all those to come to go forward in powerful faith and hope. Amen. May you have a blessed week. May you enjoy this weather as we continue to approach summertime. May God bless you and make His face to shine upon you now and forever. Amen.